Hi y'all. So if you spent any amount of time, and I mean any amount of time in the running community, you've probably heard of the term ultra marathoning or ultra marathon runners. These are people who run past the 26.2, which is the usual marathon distance and continue into mileage upwards of like 50, 100, 200 miles. Basically they're people who are like just really into running extreme mileage and get like a high almost of like running these intense mileage. In the running community, these ultra marathoners are usually referred to with like a hushed tone because people are frankly just frightened of their power. Some people idolize them, some people look up to them. Most people are like, what the heck, I don't even understand the mentality, but in the running community, they're like revered, kind of almost like gods, because who can run 50, 100, 200 miles? So these people who are the ultra marathoners basically like don't feel pain and don't build up lactic acid, which is the enzyme that kind of creates or helps contribute to the, the feeling in your legs where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't even move them anymore. So most people would consider these ultra marathoners like crazy because most people can't understand their desires and what motivates them. And most people are limited by their physical and mental strength. However, in the running community, like I said, they're revered like gods. People really admire them. However, it's only when you've been circling the running world for a while that you'll hear of the most insane race in the whole entire world and the most intense ultra marathon ever called the Barkley Marathons. In this video, I'm going to attempt, and when I mean attempt, I'm going to barely scratch the surface of the Barkley Marathons and just kind of give an explanation of their origin and just generally look at them. But if you're interested in doing like a more of a deep dive, I highly recommend these documentaries I'm gonna pop up on screen. There's so much out there about the Barkley Marathons. They used to be a little bit more secretive. Now more and more people are understanding and seeing like the absolute insanity, but also like how cool they can be. So I highly recommend these documentaries are so well done. But in this video, I just kind of like want to talk about it because I find them really fascinating and I've been following them for years now. So let's just dive into what the Barkley Marathons are. So the Barkley Marathons were created by founders Gary Lazarus Lake Cantrell and Carl Hinn, otherwise known as Raw Dog. According to the founders, they were inspired to create this legendary race because of the escape of the convicted killer of Martin Luther King Jr., James Earl Ray, from a nearby prison called Brushy State Penitentiary. During Ray's escape, he only got eight to 10 miles within the 54 hours he had escaped. Thinking this was a pathetic display of endurance and survivalism, the founders created the race to show how pitiful the escape attempt was and how much of a loser Ray was. Thus, the most intense race known to man was invented, the Barkley Marathon. Set in Frozen Head State Park, Tennessee, this race is truly not for the faint of heart. Because the terrain is rough, the climate can be pretty severe, and the reward of like winning or completing the Barkley marathons is literally just bragging rights and also most people don't even know what you're talking about and you have to go through all this explanation so there basically isn't a reward you'll just like know it for yourself a personal reward if you will so let's say for whatever reason you wanted to participate in the Barkley marathons let's walk or run <laughs> through the process of how you would apply and race in the Barkley Marathons. So every year, hundreds of people from all over decide to register to enter the Barkley Marathons, but only around 40 participants are selected each year. The actual application is secretive, but in recent years with the growing popularity of the race, the process has become a little bit more demystified. But in essence, applicants from all over the world have to explain why they want to run in the Barkley Marathons, and then they send in a registration of only $1.60, which if you've ever run in a race is really small. Sometimes races can be very expensive. So, I mean, it's just kind of interesting. It's $1.60 to apply, but that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the application process. So hundreds of people apply, only 40 are selected. And once you get selected, you're actually sent a letter of condolence, basically saying you unfortunately got chosen and selected to run in the most intense race in the whole entire world. So after you've registered and you've been selected, upon your arrival to Frozen Head State Park, runners will have to present a license plate from wherever they're from and a gift to the organizer. And this gift ranges depending on what the organizer or wants some years it's a sock 
like some socks, some years it's t-shirts, some years it's flannels, so on and so forth. But you present these items, the license plates actually just get like hung up. And this is just like the beginning. There's so much lore to this race and the license plates are one of them that they get hung up. And as people like co go out of the race, they'll hand them back the license plate, they'll take them down. It's There's so much lore, there's so much history and tradition with this. So just like bear with me if I kind of stumble through a few parts of it. But once you register, you're given the master map of the whole entire state park. And so each competitor is given this map so that they'll have a basic orientation of the actual like state park in general and the landscape. With this map, you're just kind of given vague instructions about like what the trail looks like. In general, the trail is kind of just like a mystical thing, but there are some landmarks that we'll get into and talk about and discuss that prior com competitors or veterans have passed down to the virgin competitors. Additionally, virgin competitors, which I hate that term, but like we'll just use it because that's the verbiage that they use, virgin competitors usually try to pair up with a veteran or someone who's like competed in the Barclays in the past because it'll help them get through because the trail is not told to you. On that master map, an important component of it is that there isn't like a, a route on there. You have to figure out where you're going. And that's where we're gonna get into kind of like the basics of this race. So the basics of the Barclays. So the race begins at the Yellow Gate and the Yellow Gate is another piece of lore of the Barclay. It is like the famous Yellow Gate, which is the entrance to the Frozen Head State Park. And also beyond the gate is where the kind of runners um, camp is and where people can camp out and tent out with families and stuff. So let's get into like actually what each loop consists of. So the loops are about 20 miles each where this is just a rough estimate some people suggest it's actually closer to 26 miles, which is the length of one marathon. So the goal is to complete five loops. And for those keeping track at home, that ends up being over a hundred miles of distance that you're covering during this race. So the goal is to complete that hundred miles within 60 hours. And now you might be thinking to yourself, that's over two entire days. When do they sleep? And that's a good question. And boy, do I have some news for you. They don't really sleep. They sleep, but that's just like basically like very many naps because they have to complete these loops within that time requirement. And eventually you can be statistically eliminated because each loop has to be about 12 hours ish. So you have to complete those loops like pretty, there's a pretty quick pace that you have to keep up. But anyway, Three loops, if you complete three loops, that is called the fun run, which is not fun in any way, but people are just so demented that the three loops is called a fun run, but most people don't even make it into the second loop. So that's why it's kind of an achievement just to do the three loops, but the five loops is the goal and that means you're a winner. Now, <clears throat> I'm about to get into like the actual nitty gritty of like what the loops look like. So just bear with me. So now that we know the basics, there's five loops, let's get into the funky bits of it. The runners will complete the loops twice clockwise. So two times it'll be clockwise. Then the next two, you'll reverse it and it'll be counterclockwise. Then to add some spice on the fifth loop, they will send the remaining participants out in opposite directions. So I hope that makes sense two clockwise, two counterclockwise, and then two, however many participants, they're all sent in different directions, completing the race in opposite directions. So if you've made it to the fifth loop and you're the first runner, congrats, uh, one, amazing, but two, you also get to choose which direction. Like I said, they get sent in opposite directions. And so if you're the first runner, you get to choose which like direction of the loop you'd rather complete. Okay, so we got it, five loops, different directions each time basically, and the loops are concurrent, which means that some of these loops Loops that you will do are completed within the day and some are also completed at night. Very scary, very spooky. And at least one participant said that each loop is very unique and different. Throughout each loop, runners will climb at an elevation of 12,000 feet and descend 12,000 feet, which when multiplied for each loop will be an elevation change of at least of at least 120,000 feet, which is close to ascending and descending Mount Everest at least twice, which is crazy. Oh yeah, also they actually don't know when they're going to start these loops. According to the organizer, they just narrow down the window to a casual 12 hours. On the Saturday of a race weekend, the race can begin anytime between 12 a.m. and noon that day. So racers are just kind of twiddling their thumbs in the racing camp until the organizers blow on a conch shell. Again, 
so much lore to this. So the organizers will blow on a conch shell and then the participants will know that they have about an hour from when the shell is blown until when the actual race begins. I know this sounds wild, but honestly, this is kind of tame compared to some of the other aspects of this race. So the conch shell has been blown, all the runners line up at the yellow gate, and to send them off, the organizer lights his cigarette, and this indicates to the, to the runners and the participants that it's time to begin. And it's time to endure the next 60 hours of basically pushing your mind and body to its absolute limits testing every boundary you have and even some you didn't know you had. All to say that you completed the Barkley Marathons, but most of the people who start at the Yellow Gate won't make it. Okay, so we've gone through the basics. So let's say you started the Barkley Marathon, right? You've gone past the Yellow Gate and you begin. So you will begin the Barkley Marathons by orienteering your way through the race. Like I said, you get the master map, but you don't get the actual trail loop. So you're expected to orienteer throughout the marathon. So you're expected to orienteer throughout the marathon. And I guess now is a good time to say that not only do you not know where the trail is, the trail's not marked and you have no GPS. You're just allowed a basic compass. Oh, also another piece of information that I forgot to mention is that you have to pack everything because there are no aid stations. In normal races, you'll run past aid station after aid station with like goose, waters, Gatorade, things like that. No such thing in the Barclay Marathons. You'll be lucky if there's a water drop that's basically these big jugs of water scattered throughout the race, but there's only like two of them. So you're gonna have to keep all of your aid on you because you won't be seeing any aid until you get back to the camp after the first loop. Which I mean, hey, there's rivers you can drink from the river if you have like a life straw or something. So it's not all negative. Okay, so let's say you've paired up with a veteran and you two are going throughout the trail. So what you'll be doing is you'll be running, rock climbing, traversing the rocky and craggly course. You'll be doing some scaling of rock walls. You'll be going up really intense inclines. Like I said, you're going to be ascending and descending like several Mount Everests. And while doing this, you might be thinking to yourself like, how do I know I'm on the right track? How do I know I'm orienteering correctly? Especially like, let's just say you don't get paired up with a veteran and no one wants to be with you. Well, you'll know you're on the right track when you see a book, of course. A book will help you know that you are on the trail and you're doing the Barkley Marathons correct. That's right. To make sure people are on the right track, the evil geniuses who have created this race have placed books, literal books along the trail. And part of the race is making sure that you rip at least one page of the book to ensure that you are following the trail exactly like it's meant to be intended. At the beginning, you're given a number that corresponds to the page number that you're going to rip out. So at the end of the loop, you're supposed to hand over each page that you've ripped out from the corresponding books along the trail to the judges. And if you don't have, or if you're missing one of the pages, that sucks, you get disqualified. So make sure that you are able to not only rip out the appropriate page number, that you're able to secure and save it in a place where you know that it won't be lost. The addition of the books is actually a cute, but definitely sadistic way to keep people accountable. The amount of books varies per year, but you'll have to show, like I said, the judges at the end that, you, that you've successfully ripped out your correct pages for each loop you complete. So at the end of each loop, you're given another um, running number so that you'll that time around during that another loop that you'll rip out that corresponding page. Another interesting piece of lore that this race has is the unofficial landmarks, like I mentioned at the beginning, with names such as Pillars of Doom, the bad thing and checkmate hill these landmarks help people navigate their way through the course but the wildest landmark is the active brushy state penitentiary which is a legit and very active state prison that contestants will have to literally climb under using a tunnel that is underneath the prison so if you're able to get through the first loop while avoiding the sharp briars that rip people's skin open going through the rivers going under the prison and climbing up steep sides basically you've now entered the interloopal period or the time between loops where you're able to receive aid from others. So let's take you through the support of the race. Also something interesting and just kind of like a fun fact that they mentioned during one of the documentaries is that the slowest recorded time on the race trail was that somebody only went two miles in the race during one loop, which again, the loops are like 26 miles. So they went two miles <laughs> over the course of 32 hours, which is a, it was about a 16 hour per mile pace. So 
it was just kind of a bad day for them. So you get back from your loop and let's discuss what's at the bottom of that like race village. So because the race is a loop, there's a race village of sorts at the beginning of the loops. Like I said, at the beginning of the Frozen Head State Park beyond the Yellow Gate. The runner's village is where runners, their families, and their support crew set up their stuff and camp while they are waiting for the conch shell. These encampments also serve as aid stations, so to speak, for the runners when they have completed a loop. I mean, say what you will about these folks, but I, it does seem like a legitimate community. And I mean, past participants come from all over the world just to indulge in the excitement of the race. And even when watching the videos, like the documentaries and stuff, I can see why people like it. I mean, it has a certain addictive quality quality to it and the atmosphere surrounding the race, specifically in the runner's village, it's just kind of like electric. So during this interlupal period, you can visit the campsites and replenish your stocks and your supplies. You can also sleep during this period, which will become explicitly important during the later parts of the loops where you're starting to be sleep deprived. But you have to be mindful, like I said, of the time during these stops because the clock keeps ticking. There is no stop. You have to complete the five loops within the 60 hours to be victorious. So after a certain time, you're statistically eliminated. So you have to use your rest time very sparingly and just kind of keep track of where you're at in the race because your times will decrease as you get tired. Your first time is going to be like the fastest theoretically. And then every time after that, it's just gonna get harder and harder. So you kind of have to keep that in mind. Okay, so you've done loop one, you've rested, you've gotten some nourishment, and now you've received another number. So you're off on loop two. But this time, depending on when you started, when the conch shell was blown, you may be going out into the mountains of frozen in Head State Park completely in the dark. And some people have like lights and things like that, but it's just getting psychologically very difficult. So people have definitely like lost it a little bit, especially as like the number of people who completed dwindled down. And then you're out there basically alone out in the woods and you kind of start thinking, what am I doing? I'm testing myself, my body hurts, I'm mentally challenged. And some people are just like, I don't wanna do this. And maybe that's you. So let's say you have kind of like gotten to your wits end. You've taken all you can physically and emotionally and you're just like, I'm done. Please take me out of my misery. I need to go home and rest. So like what happens then? So when you decide or when anyone decides to kind of call it quits and tap out, so to say, they will bring out a bugle they will play taps to commemorate your time as a participant of the Barkley Marathons and they will take down your license. And honestly, you'd be in good company because most people don't finish for a number of reasons, the main one being exhaustion. But let's discuss the people who were able to overcome those enormous obstacles and finish. Let's talk about the winners, baby. So according to Wikipedia, the Barkley Marathons have only been completed 21 times by 17 different runners, which is staggering considering the race started in 1986. And there are about 40 participants each time. I'm not gonna do the math, but you can on your own time. But usually there's about one to two winners each year with this year actually being kind of an exception with three people completing the Barkley Marathons this year. Just to kind of highlight how spectacular it is, the only other time that there were three winners was 2012. And although I can't get into each winner individually, I will just say that all of them are just like incredible people because the absolute massive psychological, physical, and emotional damage that they went through to become winners of the Barkley Marathons is an incredible testimony to the human spirit. I will say special shout out to Gary Robbins, which if you're in the running community, you've probably heard that name before, big name in running. Gary Robbins is actually one of the reasons I got into the Barkley Marathons because I watched the documentary about him, but shout out to him because he barely almost, he's, he's a winner in my heart because he like, I think it was like a minute or a few seconds after 60 hours, he completed the Barkley Marathons, but he's not considered a winner. But like, again, just, he's a winner in my book. Also, one of the things that inspired me to do this uh, video was one of the winners, winners from this race was actually a person that like almost completed it last year, but like fully had a psychological breakdown and because of sleep deprivation, like fully hallucinated and was like running through the woods, like hallucinating, um, which is a consequence of the Barkley Marathons is hallucinations and sleep deprivation, but they persevered. I don't know why they wanted to come back, but they did it this year. So congrats to that person. So 
we've talked about the basics. We've talked about what you do during the Barkley marathons and we've talked about the winners. So I think that like, this is just kind of like a basic overview of like what happened. Let me just say this race is wild and physically, mentally, and spiritually seems to be the race to end all races. But also, like I mentioned, I see why people like it. I see why people are drawn into the whole thing. It's an amazing and wild experience that you're truly never going to have like a comparable experience ever in your life. The Barkley Marathons are just like an amazing testament, like I said, to like how much humans can persevere and be pushed to their absolute limits and still survive. And it's also a testament to how sick and twisted humans can be and how people love to devise sadistic races. I will say, I love looking at races like this. And I've I've known about the Barclays for years. I've followed it for years. Like I said, the documentary about Gary Robbins, which I would highly suggest if you're interested, please go look at any of these documentaries. They're so top tier and so cool and interesting and just kind of like, a deep dive into a niche group of human beings but like watching those documentaries got me super interested to it into it and I just I don't know I like it I like looking at that I like seeing how people test their bodies and things like that so I find it fascinating also I would love to be the human sacrifice one year, which I didn't go into the human sacrifice, but the human sacrifice is basically a person who has no business being there, that they just kind of like put in for like a chuckle because again, people are sadistic and specifically the organizers are sadists <laughs> in like a loving way. But basically I would love to be a human sacrifice in the Barkley marathons because I need to be humbled. <laughs> and I think it would just completely humble me. But that was a basic overview of the Barkley marathons and kind of a, a deep dive into like why they're so interesting to me but again this is just like this slight surface level there's so much to learn about the Barkley marathons and specifically going into why people participate and how they do in these Barkley marathons so if you're interested like I said please go check it out like give them some love it's so interesting and but I think I will continue just like checking up on the Barkley marathons and seeing how they go each year looking at all the the information about it just kind of like silently stalking it but that's all I have for you for this video I hope you enjoyed and I hope to see you in the next one bye